Spiritual Warfare, The Call to Arms, 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18, and this will be lecture number 14.3. Title, the title of this message is The Mantle of Moses and Elijah. Purpose, through searching scriptures, we will see specific supernatural spiritual warfare abilities that was made available to Elijah because of his submission to the Lord's call. These same spiritual weapons of warfare are the same abilities that will be made available to us when a great end time battle on earth begins. At the end of this message, we will also uncover a very profound revelation that shall set the pace for many around the world to commence their wilderness experience with the Lord as soon as possible. And so the highlight, the, the bullet highlight will be the judgments and miracles of God through his servant Elijah. First Kings chapter 17, and it says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there so he went and did according unto the word of the Lord for he went and dwelt by the brook of Sherith uh, that is before Jordan and the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening and he drank of the brook and it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land and the word of the Lord came unto him saying arise Get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So the Lord pronounces a judgment upon the land that rain shall be withheld until Elijah gave the word. The Lord gave authority over Elijah in regards to these plagues. No other person in the earth had the ability to reverse this plague regardless of their standing before the Lord. It was only given to one man, and this one man was Elijah. Although there was a famine in the land, provision was made to provide for his chosen servants every need. The Lord commanded the ravens to feed him at the appointed time, led him to a safe place in the wilderness hidden from the enemy, and provided him with living waters. The early life of Elijah was never spoken of, and little is known about him and his childhood. This is because Elijah was a hidden servant of the Lord kept away in his secret quiver for a time such as this, when Jezebel, the whore of Babylon, arisen, arises to take the land at that time frame. So we're going to read some scriptures which are going to help validate some of these statements that was just mentioned. In Psalms chapter 127, it says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wa waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrow, for so he grieveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of, heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And it goes on to say in verse number 4, As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is a man that hath this quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with, uh, with the enemies in the gate. So this would be an example of Elijah. It was because it was the Lord who established the watch over Jerusalem during the time, not only Jerusalem, but of all of Israel during the time of Jezebel and Ahab's reign. So it was the Lord who established the watchman, which was Elijah. And it was the Lord who also set forth provision to his watchman to ensure that he shall be successful in the mission that was at hand. And then in verse number four, you know, uh, well, beginning in number three, it says that, you know, a ch that children are inherited in heritage from the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward, right? So these children, Elijah, was a blessed child, a child that came from a blessed family. And so it goes on to make a spiritual parallel, a reflection onto our God where it says, and happy is a man to have his quiver full of them because the Lord has a has his quiver full of these secret weapons, these secret arrows that he has unleashed over the course of biblical history that has made major impacts upon the kingdoms of darkness. And it says that they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And this has been, in this case, Elijah's powerful, you know, key point is that the Lord had Elijah hidden away in his quiver. And when the time came, he was one of his sharp arrows that the Lord pulled out to strike at the heart of the Jezebel Ahab kingdom at this time. And so in uh, Psalms 
83, it says, They have taken craft the council against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. So you see, this tells you right now that the Lord has his, you know, secret weapons, hidden arrows that he hides away for a time that in which they need to be utilized to make a major impact on a biblical stage. And so Elijah was a prime example of one of these hidden arrows that the Lord utilized to make a major impact as we have read throughout the, you know, Bible history. And so in uh, Isaiah 49, it says, Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye before, hearken ye people from afar. The Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword, and a shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft, and his quiver hath he hid me, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel and whom I will be glorified. So the hidden secret here is that the Lord has a quiver filled with arrows. You know, he has a hidden quiver filled with arrows. And when the enemy decides to set up a standard against his people to try to destroy his people, to corrupt his people, to cause the people to fall away from their God, which is our God, Yahweh, the Lord will then pull one of these arrows out of his quiver and begin to unleash it against the enemy and cause major damage to the kingdom of darkness. So Elijah was an example of a hidden child because no one knew of Elijah until the appointed time when he was risen up. Um, next, we read in, chap in Isaiah chapter 49 where Isaiah speaks about him being a hidden one. And so in these last days, the Lord has a, a hidden group of 144,000 um, chosen vessels that has been hidden for a time such as this, which shall raise up a mighty standard against the kingdom of darkness. So in Revelation chapter 12, it says, And a woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, and they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. So this right here speaks of the provision, how Elijah, the Lord provided the river, you know, the brooks to give him the water that he needs to survive during the time of the famine, through the word that was spoke uh, that was spoken, which withheld the rain, and also uh, we learned that it was ravens that brought meat and bread onto Elijah twice a day to take care of his basic, you know, food nourishments. And so when we read here, we find this parallel in Revelation chapter 12, how when the woman fled into the wilderness, that the Lord already had a place prepared, you know, for her, where she would be fed and taken care of during that season. And so. This lets us know that in Revelation chapter 12, the Lord has given us an example in the Old Testament through Elijah and how he actually does this. Because he had Elijah go down to the brook so he has water to drink and ravens brought food for him twice a day, bread and water. Oh, bread and uh, meat. In Revelation chapter 13, it says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto, onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that might fly into the wilderness into her place. Now this is a place prepared for her by God, where she is nourished for a time times and half a time from the face of the serpents. And a serpent casts out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now, why is this important is that because the moment Elijah finished pronouncing the judgment of God, where there will be no rain on the land producing a famine, the Lord did not permit Elijah to be in harm's way. But immediately, the Lord brought Elijah out of that dangerous situation, brought him to the wilderness, where in the wilderness, he would be cared for and taken care of for that season. And so this is the big nugget to take away from here is that the Lord will not leave you in harm's way, but will take you to a place in the wilderness prepared for you. Because when they, after Elijah was taken into the wilderness, they could not find him because he was hidden in God in a place that the Lord has prepared. And in 1 Kings chapter 16, it says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of, Z of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in a house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So Ahab, <clears throat> through, so Ahab married 
Jezebel, the whore of Babylon, the prostitute. You'll see later on how she is the whore of the book of Revelations. And so he married her. And what she ended up doing is bringing in the worship of Lucifer. Because we know that Baal, Beelzebub, prince of the demons, this all refers to Lucifer. So Jezebel, who bought in Baal, the worship of Lucifer, is the same as the woman in the book of Revelation who rides the beast, where she will bring now the end time worship of the Antichrist, worship of the dragon and the serpent. And you will see this more in detail. And it's very interesting how she is from Zidon, which is a territory in Tyre in Syria, where we know that the Bible speaks about the Syrian coming, you know, the Antichrist coming to invade Israel. So all this ties together to a more prophetic understanding to the book of Revelations, how the harlot, you know, the woman who is known as, you know, the harlot that writes the beast, the Babylon, the mystery of Babylon, is none other than the spirit of Jezebel. And so Revelation chapter 2, it says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which call herself a prophetess, because she is a false prophet, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, in other words, to commit idolatry and a worship of other false gods, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. This was the ministry of Jezebel in the land of Israel, is that she led God's people away into committing adultery against God and fornicating with idols. And in verse 21, it says, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not because Jezebel is a stubborn spirit. And in verse 22 it says, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So the Lord is telling you that Jezebel is the one who will be responsible for the great tribulation. All right, so when you read and learn about the Jezebel spirit and all that she has done in bringing in the worship of Lucifer, the worship of the Antichrist, she will be the one responsible for bringing in the great tribulation because of all the people that will fall for her adulterous, idol, idol, you know, idolatry ways. So that is why it's very important to understand what the scripture says about Jezebel in the Old Testament and what they're saying about Jezebel in the book of Revelations because it is one and the same. And the Lord is telling you is that to follow after this Jezebel spirit and to commit fornication with her will plunge you into the great tribulation. Revelation chapter 18. So Revelation chapter 18, before we go into this, speaks about the whore of Babylon that rides the beast and the punishment that is due her. Um, so the scripture has made it clear that this whore of Babylon, this harlot that rides the beast in Revelation is the spirit of Jezebel. It is Jezebel. And we're about to find out a key word that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 18, which ties it back to what happened in the book of Kings under the time of Elijah and Elisha. And in Revelation chapter 18, it says, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, and the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. So remember how in the story of Elijah, before he was taken up in the chariots of fire unto heaven, um, he asked his <clears throat> armor bearer, Elisha, what would he do for him before he left? And so Elisha asked Elijah for a double portion of his spirit so that he would go on to do double the amount of great things to the glory of God. And so Elisha, through the permission of the Lord, was able to leave his mantle behind where Elijah Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha would take hold of this mantle and with this mantle he would do great, uh, he would do even greater things, double portion to what Elijah had did in his time that he was here. And so in verse number 16 it says, reward her double. So while Elisha was rewarded a double portion of the Elijah spirit, right? The whore of Babylon, Jezebel, shall be rewarded double for her sins, where she will have twice the amount of punishment, twice the amount of judgment. So this here is a very key scripture that ties it into Jezebel being the whore of Babylon and uh, Elisha with the double anointing 
comparing that to the opposite consequence of Jezebel who gets the double amount of punishment and judgment. So the whore that rides the beast is none other than the Jezebel spirits and the Jezebel system with all of its abominations and whoredoms and idolatries which leads many to the worship of Lucifer through the Illuminati system and all these other stuff, the Luciferian systems. This was Jezebel brought into the land of God's holy people was the worship of the devil. Moving on to verse number seven, it says, How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Now, what's very interesting about this is that Ahab, remember that Ahab was killed in a battle against the king of Syria, right? And so once Ahab was killed, Jezebel continued to live on as a queen. Now there have been has there has been many successors that has came after Ahab, his sons, which took the throne, and also who were killed, and there was much usurping at which took place of the throne of Israel. But Jezebel continued to remain in her position of authority, where she boasts in her heart and says that she still sits as queen and am no widow despite the fact that her husband Ahab was killed. And she said that, and she also says, and shall see no sorrow, which means that she will continue to boast of herself and, and enjoy the delicacies of sitting as queen of Israel. And so in 1 Kings chapter 18, it says, And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So Jezebel persecuted the prophets. She had the prophets of God killed, where it was by the faithfulness of Obadiah who took many of these prophets and hid them in caves. And in 1 Kings 19, beginning of verse 13, it says, and it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What dost thou hear, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So this is after Elijah ran from Jezebel and did 40 days in the wilderness, making his way to the mountain of God, where the Lord spoke to him through fire, well, through a still small voice. In verse 15 it says, And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint uh, Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, who was the person who later on uh, killed Jezebel through the ministry of Elisha. It goes on to say, And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, thou shalt anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel-Meholah, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of, of Hazel shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have... It says, Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, which is a remnant, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, every mouth which hath not kissed them. So now we're moving on to Second Kings chapter 9, because you see we're, we're just following a sequence of scriptures which ties into Jezebel being the harlot of Babylon and how the parallels between the Old Testament and the book of Kings and the New Testament and the book of Revelations, how it speaks about the same person. So, and verse number 30, in Second Kings chapter 9, it says, And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. Because remember, Ahab has already died, but yet she still sat as queen and saw no sorrow because she was full of herself, full of her abominations. And she did not consider herself a widow because she did not mourn the death of Ahab. She was only concerned about her position as queen. And it says, And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face. Remember, because she know no sorrow, right? She painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace, who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, Throw her down. 
So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, Go see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king, a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore, they came again and told him. And he said, This is the word of the Lord, which... He spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In a portion of Jezreel shall dogs, right, beast, dogs, shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in a portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. So she was consumed and never seen again by dogs, by beast. Now, this is important because when we go to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 16, it gives you the fulfillment of this parallel in a spiritual sense. And it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and make her desolate and naked, and shall what? Eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So the beast shall eat the harlot, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. This is a parallel to Second Kings chapter nine, where it says, "Let me see," in verse number thirty-six, it says, "In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel." So the harlot that is in the book of Revelations is none other than the spirit of Jezebel, that shall persecute the prophets and shall slay many and lead many saints into the great tribulation, who eats of her fornication you know, who, who fornicates with her and eat of her adulterous ways. Uh, moving on to verse number 17, it says, For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Now, verse number, Revelation chapter 8, it goes on to say, There shall be it says, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her and strong was the judgment of Jezebel in the book in the Old Testament and it says rejoice over her thou heaven and ye holy apostles and prophets for God hath avenged you on her because remember what Jezebel did to the prophets she slew the prophets to the point where the prophets had to hide in caves by the faithful servant Obadiah who provided for them and in verse number 23 says and the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by the sorceries were all nations deceived. And it was by the sorceries of Jezebel was all the nations, all the people of Israel deceived. And this is why the Israel, this is why she raised up the Baal prophets, whom the Lord utilized Elijah to humble and to destroy the works of Baal, the devil. In verse 24 it says, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth and why were they slain because they would not bow down to Baal they would not bow down to Satan they would not serve the satanic agenda and so the moment provision was finished in one area the brook the Lord already commanded his provision to be provided elsewhere in, in uh, Zarephath uh, by the hands of the widow. This is the life of the servant of the Lord who, is, who has surrendered everything to follow the commission of God. Um, next we have Luke chapter 14 where it says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sister, yea, and his own life, also he cannot be my disciple. So the Lord's not saying that you must hate your family, but he says that the, the love of God must come before the love of your family. And so he is telling them that they must surrender everything. Now, in verse 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down and, co and counteth the cause where he has uh, sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it. All that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So this here is counting the cost to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If you wish to tap into this level of anointing, this Elijah anointing, uh, it will cost you everything. What it means, it will cost you everything that you put before God. And so many things, many people think they don't put before God, but until they're presented with that actual item, that actual 
thing of great value, then you will realize, whoa, I didn't know I had such value of this thing over God. And so the Lord is telling you that in order to be his mighty Elijah in these end times, it's going to cost you everything. And verse 31, or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. So this here speaks about the spiritual warfare that will be upon you. And first, and then like, will you actually be strong enough in the Lord to continue on in the spiritual warfare and not give up? And 32, it says, Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. But this is the peace that we must make with God and not the enemy. In verse 33, it says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all, you see that? So likewise, whoever be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So the Lord is making it crystal clear. Many people say that they want to be used by God in a mighty way in these end times. They want to operate in high levels of anointing. But the Lord is telling you that it's going to cost you. Verse 33 says that you must forsake all things to be his disciple. Just like the 12 apostles forsake everything and follow the Lord wherever he went. In verse 34, it says salt is good, right? But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So the Lord is saying that, hey, you know, if you claim to be a person who is willing, who has the potential to be this anointed vessel, but yet you begin to walk this line that the Lord is calling you to, and you find out that it's too much for you to, uh, to give up, and you are not willing to give up, and you decide to turn back, then you will be the example of losing your saltiness, for you are no good for any good work and shall be cast out. So be mindful about the decisions that you make and count the cost of what it will cost you. Because there is a great price to pay for the anointing. <clears throat> now we're moving on to 1 Kings chapter 17. And it says, So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in the hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a an handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a crust. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I might I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. So as you can see, this widow was down on her luck because the famine had struck the land and her provision was running out. Verse 13, And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the crust of oil fell until the day that the Lord sendeth the rain upon the earth. So this required a great deal of faith for this woman to believe this word as she was to do this thing. But then again, she had nothing to lose because death was the next option after she had this small morsel of provision to eat. And so now, the servant who takes care of a prophet of God shall reap a mighty reward, as we see in this story. Sometimes it will result in the servant to give their very last to support the mission of the prophet by faith. A great reward shall be reaped, especially in a time of great lack. The, miracle, the mighty miracles that shall be available to God's people is the ability to have unlimited supply of food for a season, but it will cost you your very last in supporting another. And so this goes back to what I mentioned before, is that when you support a prophet and take care of a prophet, you shall reap a prophet's reward as the Lord declare. And one of the rewards that this woman reaped is to have provision given onto her in the same way that God had provision given onto Elijah. And so as a result of her faithfulness and believing a word that seemed impossible to believe, but she believed it anyway and proved it by her obedience, the Lord was able to bless her in a mighty way. And this is a message for all of us for when the hard times come in the future, is that sometimes it will require us to give our very last just before the mighty anointing breaks forth for the Lord is providing for our needs in a supernatural way such as this. 
First Kings chapter 17, verse 21, and it says, And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into, his, into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. You hear that? The Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came in into him again, and he revived. There's an important message in this. <clears throat> now, it says, With the mantle of Elijah, the anointing of God was able to raise the dead and restore the son back to his mother. The key is to be a clean vessel before the Lord, so he can hear your prayer. If you are not a clean vessel before the Lord, purified by his holy fire, uh, but is stained with sin, your prayers will not be effective in raising the dead, and it will not happen. The reason is the Lord does not hear the prayers of those living in sin. In Isaiah chapter 59, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your inequities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So the key to having the Lord answering our prayers and performing miracles on our behalf in these last days will be will rest on whether the Lord will hear our prayers or not. And this will be greatly determined by the sins, the unrepentant sins you have in your life. Sins in your life that you have not repent of will hinder the miracles of God from operating in your life. This is why you must be a, you know, instrument of gold. You must be uh, a vessels of gold and not of wood and clay. Because the vessels of gold is what the Lord shall up operate his anointing through. And Elijah was an example of a vessel of gold because he was purged of his flesh. He was repentant of all sins that he was able to do accordance with the sanctification of the Lord. And as a result, in verse number 22, it says that, And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. So if the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, then that means that he stood in righteousness and in purification before the Lord. So if you wish to operate in this soon anointing to be poured off, it's strongly recommended that we all take a look in the mirror, a serious look in the mirror, and be honest with God and tell him the struggles we have in our life, for he is able to sanctify us and purify us of these sins. All right, so moving along, and it says, In order to be that anointed vessel of Yahweh, positioned to receive the end-time anointing to come, you must be a clean vessel purged of the sins of this world. This does not mean to be perfect, but rather to press in deeper in your personal relationship with Yahshua, so he can remove those things which bind you up. Only he can purify you, and this is done through his blood in which he shed on the cross. Now we're at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 1, and it says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria, the capital of Israel. And so in verse number 42, it says, So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees, and it came to pass that at the seventh time, so we have to be very persistent at times when the Lord commands us to do something, not quitting on the first try, but it took seven times for this to happen. And it says, uh, and it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So with complete and unwavering obedience and the will, to the will of the Lord, Elijah went th uh, where the Lord told him to go and spoke what he heard the Lord tell him to say. When a appointed time was right, the Lord commanded Elijah to speak the word and by faith to be persistent, trusting in his instruction until the word was fulfilled. So in order to be counted worthy for the end time anointing to come, the Lord expects an end time army that will obey his every order without question and do only that uh, which he tells us to do. So the higher the anointing, the higher the cost if we disobey. And this will, we will see it now in Numbers chapter 20 in the story of Moses. 
And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So that so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. So the Lord commanded Moses to speak to the rock. He didn't tell him to do anything else, but told him to speak to the rock, to give water onto the congregation after their complaints and murmur against God and Moses. So in verse number nine, and it says, and Moses took the rod before the Lord as he commanded him. Right. So he took the rod as the Lord commanded him to take it. But at the end, Moses was supposed to speak to the rock. In verse number 10, it says, And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand with his rod. He smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank in their beasts also. So as you can see here, Moses disobeyed the word of the Lord. The Lord told him to speak to the rock, but yet Moses and his anger, given into his anger and frustration of the people, and the pride and rebellion against the commandment of God, thinking that he can do this and God will be okay with it, he strikes the rock twice. Now there's still a miracle that happened afterwards, but this is not what God commanded him to do. He was not being a good soldier. And so in verse number 12 it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. So you see, the Lord requires us to be good soldiers of Christ and to obey every order that comes from him. You understand? So when we decide to do things our own way, and Moses did things in a very abrupt way, which dishonored God, and which God was not sanctifying the eyes of the people, and as a result, you know, like I said before, the higher the anointing, the higher the cost if you break the anointing. And so Moses fell heavily where he was no longer permitted to continue on into the office and bringing them into the promised land once all that was made ready was done for them in the wilderness. And this was passed on to his armor bearer, uh, Joshua, to continue the assignment. Um, and so as you can see here, there's a parallel between Moses and Joshua and Elijah and Elisha that I will address in 14.4 of our study. Now, another feature of the Elijah anointing was his ability to outrun a chariot. He had super speed which means that he was faster than horses in this case. And so now the people of Yahweh will be granted beyond amazing anointing when the time comes. But in order to be counted worthy, we must be a pure vessel, which means we must purge, us, purge ourselves of sin by pressing into a closer relationship with Yahshua, with Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say, willing to completely lay down our very lives for him. We must be willing to die for the Lord. If you are not willing to be killed for the cause of Yahshua, we will not be counted worthy for the anointing. This this requires great surrender of our lives, fasting, prayer, and repenting. Ultimately, selection will be based on our hearts. And since our hearts are so greatly deceitful, only the Lord knows the true condition of it, and will and will know those worthy for selection. Humility will be very important during this time of waiting. So in Jeremiah chapter 17, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So now we're at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36, and it says, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came there and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood, and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. So the purpose of the Elijah anointing will be to turn the hearts of the people back to God. And moving along, it says, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Lucifer. Let not one of them escape. 
And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. So the mantle of Elijah possessed, um, or the mantle that Elijah possessed, permitted him to pray an answered prayer, which resulted in the Lord sending fire from heaven as a sign of His sovereignty. The key thing to note is that it was done on His appointed time and not Elijah's. We cannot dictate to the Lord when something will happen. Instead, we must follow His lead. It was the time of the evening sacrifice in which the prayer was offered up and answered as the scripture declares. The key to operating under this mighty mantle is to do two things. The first is a complete surrender of your life to the will of the Lord. You enlist in His army and you give your life to Him obeying every instruction from the true commander-in-chief. The second is to be a pure vessel that moves the heart of the Lord to hear and answer our prayers. These are the defining factors that made Elijah a fit candidate for the mighty anointing and office that he possessed at that time. The greater anointing, the greater the cost. A vessel that seeks to be used must obey God in everything. Remember what happened to Moses. And so look at what the prophet Elijah was required to do to the prophets of Baal in accordance with the judgments, statutes, and commandments of God that we've read in the book of Leviticus. All right, so next we have 2 Kings chapter 1. And it says, Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty, with his fifty, and he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of the hill. And he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. While well, looking at this, a direct order, right? And so in verse number 10, it says, And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Again also he sent unto him another captain of fifty and his fifty. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto him, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Verse 13, And he sent again the captain of the third fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah, and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of this fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came fire down from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former fifties and their fifties. Therefore let my life now be precious in thy sight. And check this out. It says, And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah. So look who was bringing now fire from heaven by the spoken word of Elijah. It was an angel of the Lord who was sent to minister unto Elijah. So now go down with him. This is what the angel says. It says, Go down with him. Be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, For so much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, or Lucifer, shall we say, it is not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word. Therefore thou shalt not come down off of that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And so what was so interesting is that in verse number 15, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah. So what we are witnessing here is a partnership, a team that has taken place where Elijah was speaking forth a word. And then there was an angel that the Lord commanded to serve Elijah in these things. For they are ministering spirits unto those who are receiving salvation, right? And the, this angel of the Lord was bringing down fire from heaven with the authority that God gave him to consume these captains. That is a huge nugget to remember for the end times because in the end times the Lord will be giving angels will be given you know his anointed vessels charge you no know, you know general military command over angels where the angels will be serving us and assisting us and carrying out the will of God where we will speak something forth and these angels like faithful soldiers of the Lord will go forth and execute it in the way we see it here all right so anyway it says for a brief background story the name of the king that sent for Elijah was King ah uh, Ahaziah. Uh, he was the king of the northern part of Israel after they were divided. He fell ill after an accident and told his messengers to consult Beelzebub, prince of the demons, to see if he will recover. While en route, the Lord has 
Elijah intercept this messenger and deliver a word from him. After the king received this word from the messenger, he then directed that they bring Elijah to him. So this is how we got to this point. But now, and let's talk about Beelzebub real quick. In Luke verse number 11, it says, well, chapter 11, verse 14, it says, And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb, and it came to pass, when the devil was gone out, the dumb spack, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto him, Every kingdom divided against itself, is brought to desolation, and a house divided against his, a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. So right here, the key thing I want you to take away is that the Lord reveals the identity of Beelzebub as Lucifer himself. And so Jezebel. The whore of Babylon is the one who introduced the worship of Satan, Baal, to the Israelites. When we go back to 1 Kings chapter 16, it says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, which means that king of Tyre. And we know this prophecy is speaking about the Antichrist concerning Tyre. And went and served Baal and worshipped him. And in Ephesians chapter 2 it says, Where in, in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So Baal, Beelzebub, Lucifer, Satan, all the same person. Now, there were three battle waves that came to Elijah in response to the king. The total number of soldiers that came for one man was 153, including the captains. Because of their vast numbers, they thought that they, were, they would have the advantage over Elijah. But little did they know that the Lord had sent an angel to guard Elijah against the king's men. Little did they know that Elijah was ordained by God to be a general in his army, because he was able to speak these words, and the angels carried the wrath of God out upon those soldiers. By the spoken word of Elijah, the angel that was with him called down fire from heaven to consume the 102 armed and battle-ready soldiers. This is an ability that those possessing the end-time anointing to come will be able to do. It was not until they came to the man of God with a humble spirit that the Lord permit Elijah to go down with them. Proverbs chapter 16 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And we see the scripture being fulfilled in the case of the men with 50 that came against Elijah. And James chapter 4 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but give grace unto the humble. So these soldiers came, the first wave of soldiers came very proud and arrogant. And the Lord resisted the proud, and they were consumed. But as the waves, the second and the third wave came, you notice there was a trend where they became more and more humble. And in Psalms 91, it says, A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands as thou dash thy foot against a stone. And so right now, you saw an example of Psalms 91 being fulfilled in Elijah when he had that experience against the captains of 50. And so because Elijah made the Lord his fortress, his strong tower, the Lord established him in a position of victory over all who sought to harm him. Before the enemy was within range, the Lord placed Elijah up, a, up on top of a hill where he sat down. And this is also where he was fighting from a place of victory. Because when we go to the scriptures, he was on a hill when these captains of 50 came. Complete obedience to the Lord is a must during these end times. Uh, during these end times, even when we do not understand why he is telling us to do it. The Lord Yahshua, as our commander-in-chief, has complete strategic intel on all of the enemy's plans, maneuvers, and tactics. Before the enemy can strike you, 
He positions you, this is the Lord, he positions you to, so you fight from a position of victory. But as a soldier, we must be willing to obey every direct order that is coming from the Lord. So this can be possible. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, it says, Has the Lord as great of delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than a fat of rams. Okay, so the Lord is telling you it is better to obey what he tells you to do than you to seek out to do good works that you believe that he will approve of. Obedience is key. You must be a good soldier of Christ and obey God in all that he commands you to do. Second Timothy chapter 2 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So if you're a soldier, it's time to, you know, roger up to the Lord. In verse 5 it says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Which means that when you go and achieving the anointing, achieving the plans that and the purpose that the Lord has for you, in order for you to reach that position of mastery, to be a master in your craft, to be that anointed vessel that shall do the works of God, you must make sure that you are fulfilling your duties lawfully. All right, unlawful uh, actions result in unlawful, well, results in lawful consequence and just consequences from the Lord. And a prime example, like I said before, was Moses. Is that the Lord gave him an order. Moses did not obey that order, but did it a different way, and it was unlawful. And as a result, he was disqualified from bringing the people into the promised land and never got to fulfill his call. Now, in Psalms 37, it says, The wicked plotteth against the just, and can gnash upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. So this is the complete strategic intel that I was speaking about that the Lord has. The wicked have drawn out the sword, so they had plans, and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. But in verse 15 it says, Their sword, their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. Because the Lord saw it coming, positioned his people, and took care of the threat before he even had a chance to do any damage. So no authority is greater than the Lord, not even the king. When a king sent the captain with his men demanding that Elijah come, Elijah only heeded what the Lord was instructing him to do. After the humbling of the armed soldiers who came through the third wave, the Lord then gave Elijah instruction to go with them. The Lord Yahweh is to be obeyed before all authority. We are commanded by Yahweh to submit ourselves unto the governing laws of a nation, so as long as it does not conflict with the commandments of God. No better example do we witness this than in the book of Daniel in their exile to Babylon. And three scriptures we're going to look at that covers the point here is in uh, the first one would be First Peter chapter two, and it says, "Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king as supreme, or are unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men." And in Romans chapter 13, it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that he are ordained be are ordained of God. Whosoever there uh, resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that rest or that resisteth shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. But thou then not be afraid of the power. Do that which is good. And thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God in thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Right now we're being told why it's important to submit to our governing authorities because it was established by God to establish the purpose of God. But as I said before, 
God's commandments supersede all others. And in Acts chapter 5, we see this example. And it says, Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and a high priest and asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And so now we are making it to Second Kings chapter 2, and it says, And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they stood and the two and they too stood by Jordan and Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters and they were divided hither and thither so they so that they too went over on dry ground so now that we approach towards the end of our lesson of today this here is a nugget that I spoke about that will reveal a mystery that shall definitely catapult many people to start running into the wilderness and get themselves ready for the Lord and so it says, one of the greatest feats concerning the Elijah mantle was the ability to make a way in places where there is no way. With the mantle that shall be released upon the chosen vessels of Yahshua shortly, they will have the ability to part waters in impossible places and make a way for travel and escape for themselves and Yah's people during the tribulation. Note, however, that it was by divine wisdom from the Lord that Elijah knew to do this. The evidence is observed through the servant Joshua. The Ark of the Covenant was the dwelling place of Yahweh on earth. When the priests of Israel began to walk across the Jordan River with the Ark housing the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Yahweh, the river parted and they passed on dry ground. Now, here's the revelation. When the mantle that Elijah had, with the mantle that Elijah had, he was able to also part the waters and walk on dry ground. Even with the mantle of Moses, was Moses able to pass through the Red Sea on dry ground? With the mantle of Enoch, was Enoch taken to heaven and never seen again? And also with the mantle of Yahshua, was he able to walk on water and not sink? The revelation here is that the mantle of Moses and Elijah is none other than the power of the Holy Spirit already in action in the Old Testament through certain chosen vessels. But all of this changed on the day of Pentecost as the Lord made a final outpouring of the mantle which is now available to all who receive Jesus Christ, our Lord Yahshua, as their Lord and Savior. So in other words, if you are a born-again Christian, sealed with the Holy Spirit, and empowered with the fire of God, you are already operating at a certain level of the mantle of Elijah. The harder, the greater you press in into your relationship with God, the more you will be able to start tapping in to these abilities that the Lord has released onto his servants in the Old Testament. So with that, what's going to happen in the end times? is that with the final outpouring of God's Spirit, it's not that the Lord is going to outpour His Spirit, but rather the Holy Spirit that is already dwelling in you shall perfect the work that the Lord has sent it to do, where you shall be transformed and made into the perfect image of God. And then with that special anointing, you will be able to go forth and do the final works of God before the end of the age. And so let's read Joshua 3 in closing. And it says, And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither, and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now, therefore, take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man, and it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, 
the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. And it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and a priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as they that bear the Ark were come unto the Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overflowed all his banks all the time of the harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zerton. And those that came down toward the seed of the, of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. We are now the temple of God. And the spirit of the Lord dwells in these temples. If these temples be defiled, the Lord shall not operate in a defiled temple, but will depart from this temple and allow that temple to be destroyed as it has before in the past. But if we do the works of God and sanctify these holy temples, these vessels in which the Holy Spirit dwells in, then we too shall be in position to allow the final anointing, to allow the Moses mantle, the Elijah mantle, the Enoch mantle, the Jesus Christ mantle, the Yahshua's mantle, to be fully manifested in us, but we will all then be the anointed vessels operating in the spirit of Elijah. Thank you for listening.